My name is Jason Florio. I'm a, a British American photographer basing here in Banjul. My first photographic works in the Gambia I was started in 1999, um, and when I first came here, I was living literally in the bush at uh, out of Makasutu, you know, near Kembuje. I was invited out by some friends, and I started to make portraits of the people who lived and worked around um, the forest of Makasutu. And I actually worked on that project for over 10 years. Every every year, I was coming back and creating new portraits uh, for the project. Meeting Yaya Jame, well, it, was, it was one of those uh, moments I'll never forget. Um, how it came about was I was doing some volunteer work for the National Centre of Arts and Culture, um, you know, documenting uh, you know, various festivities and masquerades. And uh, part of that, they invited me to go up to, to Kanalai in 2014 to document this Foot and Puff ceremony, or Roots Festival, I think they were calling it. Um, so I spent the whole day with, with Jame. Uh, with his entourage and he was very comfortable with all these uh, foreigners that were coming in as part of this food and puppet, it was part of the, you know, the uh, African-American diaspora. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, it was just myself and, and uh, Jame were, were alone in this sort of, it was almost like a, an empty area, he was just sat in his chair quietly by himself and his photographer said to me, oh do you want to you want to meet the big man and I was, like, oh, I was like I don't know if I really want to meet him I'm a bit nervous um, but anyway we we sat and we, we chatted and he was he was very hospitable and quite gracious um, but in my mind I was sort of thinking about all these sort of stories I'd heard about what was going on in the country and I, I hadn't met any victims at that point um, but I was kind of aware of the stories and the mythology around him so it was, it, was, uh, it was a strange moment for sure, but it was just very, it was just like we're speaking now, it was just very intimate, there was no one else around, there was no security, it was just the two of us just, just chatting. Yeah, two years later, it was, uh, I, was, I was in Dakar on a, on a project and uh, we started to hear about some of the Gambians who were in exile, some of the journalists, um, so it was Saini, MK Morena, Malaji um, Job and uh, you know that was the first time I'd actually heard from people who who had been victims themselves directly um, and it was it was really shocking to hear their testimonies again it was just sort of these stories that were floating around the ether of all the years of, of coming and going to Gambia but to actually meet people who were narrating direct stories was was uh, was really shocking to me yeah we um, during the election time, I was actually on a rescue boat out in the Mediterranean. So I was actually the day that Jame um, was uh, was defeated. I was on a rubber boat with some Gambian boys who were just literally rescued um, from a sinking boat. And I said, "You know what's happened back in Gambia today?" And they had just got the news before leaving Libya. We actually all hugged on the on the on this sinking boat. <laughs> It was an extraordinary moment, um, so I was very sad I couldn't be here for the election, um, but January the 1st, as soon as I got done with this rescue mission, I, I, Helen and I uh, came to the Gambia and you know, we were here for three months for the impasse, uh, you know, for Jamé's departure for, um, and for, you know, for Barrow's arrival. So as, as soon as um, Jamé left um, and people were coming forward, you know, victims were speaking out, people were being let out of the prisons, um, we started to meet some of some of those people, and, and I realised the extent of, of what had gone on. I was, you know, as much as I'm a journalist, I was I was really surprised. None of these stories had really sort of permeated that much, um, and we were hearing them, you know, for the first time. And they were being people could speak freely and openly. So I realised that it was a project that we really had to, uh, you know, to push forward on. Well, there's, there's so many, I think every single one has a, an, an immense weight to it. Um, you know, there's some people which you, whose stories have, have been more publicized, you know, people like uh, Yusuf Mbai, who was one of the students um, from the uh, 2000 protests, who was uh, uh, shot in the spine and has been you know, permanently crippled. Uh, you know, he was one of those names I'd, I was starting to hear a lot, and then actually meeting him in person and you know, going to his compound and seeing that his his life was, I'm not saying it's destroyed because he's, you know, he's he's really become a voice for the victims, 
Um, but to see that he, his, this young life, I think it was about you know, 18 at the time, was, has, has been wrecked and what, what he went through um, was utterly, utterly shocking. You know. Um, you know, to see him in his wheelchair, he's completely reliant on, on his brother to help him move around, you know, to do the simplest of tasks. Um, but then there's been you know, so many other people, even people like, um, say, uh, the April 14th protesters. You know, these were old guys that came out and to hear from their mouths what happened to them, for me, was, it's just extraordinary. You know, people like Kafu Bayo, Ibrahim Jabang, um, and then uh, Modo Ngom. But it's these older guys who are in their 60s who, who went out um, and you know, they said we were on a, it was a suicide mission. You know, they knew that there was a good chance they weren't going to come back alive. And to hear these, these guys that were like my, you know, my father or you know, that they were tied to tables, they were beaten and thrashed by, by young men. Um, yeah, I remember uh, Kafu Bai was talking about that his shirt, he said, I came out, I, it looked like I'd worked in a butcher's shop. I was, he said it was just covered in blood. Um, and this is a very quiet, very um, sort of, uh, how can I put it? He's, he's quite a sort of, a, a, he's a strong guy, but you know, he's, he's, he's got so much humanity to him. And to, to hear this stuff from his mouth was just, just extraordinary. But I mean, every single person we photographed has got a, a, a story that's, that touches, that's touched us to our core. Yeah, the, I think the emotional impact of hearing this is, has been been quite tough on us. Um, I, th I think the, the way we sort of lift ourselves up is the fact that a number of people who we've interviewed have said that just the fact that they've been able to tell their stories and they're given a platform to share their stories has, has really um, has, has really sort of lifted them. You know, there's been this great weight on them. And I think the fact that they can tell their stories has, um, has, has really been very therapeutic for them. So the, you know, when we hear that, that sort of brings us a, a sort of a certain amount of, not to say joy, that's not really the right word, but it, 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 it helps lift the weight from us as such. Um, that the fact that the work we're doing is not just a documentation for, uh, for advocacy or for historical purposes, that the fact that allowing these people a platform and a space to tell their stories gives them some kind of relief. I mean, that, that really pushes us forward to want to just keep working on this.